Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by. Welcome to the HCFAC hybrid meeting, June 29th, 2023. At this time, all virtual participants are in listen-only mode. For those that are in person, please mute your electronic devices at this time. Also, please be reminded if you need to use the restrooms, please use the doors on your far left and far right. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be given at that time. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. A quorum has been reached and I will now turn the meeting over to David Berenbaum. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development Office of Housing Counseling, Housing Counseling Federal Advisory Committee meeting of Thursday, June 29th, 2023. At this time, as we have a quorum, I would like to call the meeting to order. Welcome to the members of the committee and to all who are joining us today. I am delighted that we are convening in person today at the Japanese American Museum in Little Tokyo in Los Angeles, California, as well as virtually. Thank you to the over 150 guests who are viewing today and to those who have registered to make public comment later during our session. The mission of the Office of Housing Counseling is to help families to obtain, sustain, and retain their homes. We accomplish this mission through a strong network of HUD-approved housing counseling agencies and their HUD-certified housing counselors who provide professional services to over one million consumers nationwide each year. For those of you who are viewing or participating in an advisory committee for the first time, the Housing Counseling Federal Advisory Committee is mandated by Congress to advise the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development about its housing counseling program. The committee provides a forum for those involved in housing counseling to offer advice directly to the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing Counseling on ways to accomplish the objectives of our office. All committee meetings are open to the public. It is my hope today that the committee will apply all of the information that is being provided to reinforce our ongoing efforts to reach deeper into the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community through culturally and linguistically appropriate housing counseling services. Notably, this is the first Housing Counseling Federal Advisory Committee to be held outside of HUD's headquarters in Washington, D.C. over the past five years and it is my pleasure and my hope that it will serve as a model to engage with all of HUD's constituencies nationwide moving forward. At this convening, members of the Housing Counseling Financial Federal Advisory Committee will be joined by the National Coalition for Asian Pacific American Community Development and other community leaders to discuss how to best meet the housing needs of a community that speaks more than 40 languages and the challenges that they and other households with limited English proficiency face as they seek sustainable and affordable tenancies, home ownership, and housing opportunities, as well as to age in place. This is all in the face of what we recognize to be a nationwide shortage of affordable housing units. This meeting will reinforce our dedication to remove barriers to affordable housing in underserved communities including language access barriers that can be stumbling blocks to achieving successful tenancies as well as home ownership. Yesterday, the members of the committee toured a wide range of vibrant AAPI communities in Los Angeles, to mention about a few, including Little Tokyo, Koreatown, Chinatown, and others, we enjoyed, where we enjoyed connecting with our partners, met with community leaders, housing counselors, and learned about the historic neighborhoods, as well as significant community development initiatives, and as well as the needs of residents across the area. Today, we are here to really assess and for the committee to feel free to make recommendations along with our community speakers that on steps that we can take in the Office of Housing Counseling to really bring housing counseling forward and reach all of the constituents in these to begin, I would like to cover the, the robust agenda very, very quickly that we'll be seeing. Uh, is it possible to place it on the screen? 
If not, it's all right. There we go. Thank you very much. So, of course, at first we're going to have some welcoming remarks, and I'll be introducing our, dig our dig dignitaries and leaders from the community momentarily. We can go to the next slide. Uh, and then we'll be swearing in a new member of the committee. Uh, and then we have a series of what I will call amazing and really well thought out presentations. First, we're going to hear about first an update for me on the activities of the Office of Housing Counseling. And then speakers from the administration will be focusing on administration and White House priorities for the constituency that we are addressing today. Next slide. Thank you. Then we're going to be looking at trends in housing, counseling, and community development in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community, followed by a session looking at some of the very significant housing and community development initiatives that are taking place from, in fact, leaders in the community. We'll do a lunch break, uh, and then after lunch, we will do uh, a wonderful session uh, with regard to uh, looking at the role of housing counseling agencies throughout the West Coast and serving in particular this community. Now, I also note that we're very fortunate that Angie Liu, as a member of our committee, is extremely active in this constituency. And I've asked her to jump in whenever appropriate, as I invite all of our committee members to do, because I really am very focused on next steps that we can be taken. Now, after we talk about the role of the counseling organizations, and we see we have a robust group of speakers, we'll then move on uh, and we'll look at actually conducting what will be uh, our open session for public comment. Uh, and I believe that we have a, a, a good number of people who have requested public comment, both in person as well as virtually. So that said, it is my pleasure to introduce Jason Pugh, who's the HUD regional administrator. Jason joined us uh, this morning walking through a tour of the Japanese American Museum. Uh, Jason has a very significant bio uh, serving uh, you know, first extensively within the Western region representing the HUD office as well as prior to that uh, serving uh, in a number of different county and council member and mayor positions, mayor office positions so we're very appreciative of your time here this morning, Jason. Let me turn it over to you. Thank you so much, David. Um, and let me just be the first one to be able to welcome all the Federal Advisory Committee members from uh, around the country to Los Angeles. Um, we're fortunate enough also to be joined by Deputy Mayor Jenna Hornstock from the city of LA, who uh, David will be introducing later. And I really want to thank and recognize Deputy Assistant Secretary Baron Baum and the Office of Housing Counseling for bringing this meeting here to Los Angeles, and particularly here to the Japanese American National Museum. As the only regional administrator among the 10 federal regions of AANHPI descent, it's particularly meaningful, and uh, I think I, I want to express you know, particular gratitude for the opportunity to showcase and to also uh, highlight uh, Japanese American history and uh, spread that kind of understanding and um, mutual, uh, mutual uh, appreciation for each other's histories. Um, President Biden appointed me to this position to help lead HUD in Region 9, which covers the states of Arizona, California, Hawaii, and Nevada, and the Outer Pacific Islands. And it's been a tremendous honor to be in this position uh, under the leadership of HUD Secretary Marsha L. Fudge. Um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, being of AANHPI descent and being here and at, at the Japanese American National Museum does have some particular significance for me, and I want to thank the museum for its hospitality and for providing the tour that David mentioned earlier. What I really want to communicate to everybody here, especially the advisory committee m members, is that from homeless to homeowner, HUD has programs that can help people at every step along the way. We are obviously constrained by overall supply and staff capacity in various areas, making sure that local agencies work well together and are collaborating as well. But housing counseling plays an extremely important role in that process. And I think that when we can connect all of the programs that we have together, we can truly, truly optimize the utilization of resources at every step along the way 
and address the issues that we are facing um, that are the most important and most dire crisis issues, especially in Region 9, you know, of homelessness and housing affordability. And I think that, uh, you know, housing counseling, fair housing, FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, all of these parts of HUD have been doing tr such tremendous work through the pandemic and continuing through today. During the height of the pandemic, FHA's loan modification programs helped two million homeowners across the country stay in their homes when they fell behind on payments, allowed them to be able to restructure and continue paying off their mortgages. We recently lowered the mortgage insurance premiums to be able to make mortgages more affordable, which will also help borrowers, uh, home buyers and borrowers uh, make it easier for them to qualify for mortgages. We've also allowed for positive rental payment history to be able to count it towards uh, borrower's credit to make it easier for them to build credit and again qualify for, for mortgages. And of course, as David mentioned, there's recent uh, progress on language access issues, which they will go into later on today, which is all work that we are extremely proud of here at HUD. So all of this is just to say that the pandemic era measures that were put into place under CARES, under the American Rescue Plan, did a lot to help stem the tide and address these crisis issues throughout the country. We've done a lot, but we know there's a lot more to do. And I think that, um, I think that without those measures, we would be seeing a situation that's 10 times worse than it is today. So I just want to express my appreciation to all the local agencies who do the work on the ground every day with community members, to the Office of Housing Counseling for being here and for uh, uh, you know, hosting this, uh, this meeting here at, in Los Angeles. And uh, also just to want to put out the charge there for everybody to, to keep up the good work and keep fighting because that's what we need to do. It's gonna take sustained effort and continued funding to uh, really make a difference and solve the issues um, up that our communities face, particularly on homelessness and housing affordability. So thank you. Thank you, Jason. And we can really look forward to continuing to work with you and your team to realize all of HUD's strategic plan goals in, in, in the community. It's my honor now to introduce Lori Kennedy Udit, who is the Los Angeles HUD Field Office Director uh, first, thank you for all of your support in allowing us to bring the meeting here and for all of your good works that you do in the community as well. Please, Lori. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, <clears throat> so I am delighted that you've selected Los Angeles for this meeting, and it's an absolute pleasure for me to be here with all of you today. I do want to acknowledge the HUD team. Um, our Los Angeles field office is located just around the corner and that office serves the entirety of Southern California. Um, and so very diverse, large, large scope, large jurisdiction. Um, out of that Los Angeles uh, field office, we have um, approximately 130 dedicated HUD team members who all serve uh, in supporting some piece of the puzzle uh, to support strong, inclusive communities and, and safe, affordable, quality homes for all. And so I want to acknowledge the, the HUD team and all of the work that they do. We, as a whole, are really excited that this particular meeting is happening here in our neighborhood. Um, the role of housing counseling, the Office of Housing Counseling, as Jason noted, is so critical. Um, what you do helps launch the dream of home ownership for many individuals, and particularly individuals who may never have thought of home ownership as a goal for them. And so, um, so thank you for all of the work that you do. Really appreciate not only the Office of Housing Counseling, but all of the partners uh, across the communities across the country who, who make that dream a reality for all. So thanks, David. Thank you so much. And we're very fortunate as well because we have such a strong working relationship with the state of California. And later, uh, we'll have representation from the State Housing Finance Agency, who really has a model relationship with housing counseling groups within the state as well. It's my pleasure now to introduce a representative from the mayor's office. Uh, we're joined by Jenna Hornstock, who is relatively new to her position and very focused on some of the issues we're going to be talking about today. She is the Deputy Mayor for Housing. Welcome. Great. 
Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me here. I'm so pleased to be representing LA, LA's Mayor Karen Bass. Um, you're here to talk today about home ownership as a part of community development and wealth creation and how critical it is to focus our resources where there is need and to recognize that communities of color have specific needs that have to be met and woven into the fabric of solutions as we're trying to raise the quality of life for folks and particularly for us, we wanna raise the quality of life for our Angelinos. So we recognize in the city that one of the biggest hurdles in attaining home ownership is lack of funds for down payment, for closing costs, and acquisition. <clears throat> and really, you know, these down payment and closing costs are really just a small part um, of the home ownership um, puzzle and, and the overall purchase price, but it's often the greatest barrier to home ownership. And we also know that in Los Angeles in particular, we have some of the highest rents of the country, we have some of the lowest income households, and folks are cost burdened. So even though they might be credit worthy and fully able to be um, homeowners, they don't have that ability to save money, right? To, to have those costs up front. And so they really require uh, the kind of counseling and the work um, that you do and that the organizations you work with do. Now our housing department has assisted first time um, low income and moderate income home buyers um, for years. Um, and we've got three programs I wanted to highlight um, that have done some great work over the years. Our, and I apologize, I have, I, I have to say, it's, I, it's nice to be here. I just got off a plane from Japan. I was telling them, and I have a little bit of a cold, so forgive me, I got a little plane sick. Um, uh, so we have um, our low income purchase assistance program, our moderate income purchase assistance program, and our mortgage credit certificate program, although that program has been out of funds, so we need to look for a way to bring funds back to that program. Uh, but I wanted to share some statistics on these programs because they've been really successful and, and try to bring it in, particularly how they've served um, the AAPI community. So we serve borrowers from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds, and the demographics of our borrowers are generally reflective of the racial composition of our city with slightly above average number of non-white borrowers. During the past five fiscal years, we've had 449 purchase assistance loans funded through these programs, um, and these consisted of about 637 borrowers, and of those, about 20% were members of the AAPI community, so pretty great statistics there. Um, our website provides detailed information about these programs in about 100 languages. You can go up in the top right corner of our webpage and, and select a language. Um, we also work very closely with HUD-approved housing counseling agencies, so I know that's uh, we're going to talk about more about today, um, including Faith and Community Empowerment and the Shalom Center, which we know do target um, specifically our AAPI communities in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and then finally, we do participate um, with HUD and in partnership with your counselors um, in many kinds of fairs and workshops. Um, that, so it, lastly, I'd say we work in partnership with real estate professionals that also focus on um, the needs of our lower income communities and particularly um, our ethnic communities to make sure that they provide uh, appropriate culturally sensitive support and also can provide the language supports that are needed. Um, and I'm happy to report, I was told by LEHD last night that despite rising interest rates, they've done more loans than ever this year. So we know that even though um, you know it's an expensive city in LA, we know there's demand um, and interest in continuing these programs and having more home ownership opportunities. So we really look forward to our continued partnership. Jason and I have been talking, you know, we're working, as, as Jason noted, on the whole range, right? We're really focused on homelessness, bringing folks inside, but the continuum to bring people from homelessness into permanent housing. And then for those who can, how do we get them ready for home ownership? So we're really um, excited about the partnership um, Jason and team have been, been great coming to support our work and as our mayor says in locking arms with all of our partners at the community level, at the local level, at the federal level um, to do this work. So thank you. Thank you. And local partnerships are the cornerstone of HUD's operations across the country. And I want to follow up on the remark that you made with regard to the role of housing counseling organizations and the interests of our consumers nationwide. Well over half of the consumers who reach out to housing counselors remain interested in achieving home ownership as a goal. And our work continues to grow in pre-purchase and home ownership education. But also meeting today, we have to acknowledge that there are consumers nationwide continuing to recover from the impact of the pandemic. And while the nation is beginning to move forward, and we see a lot of policy decisions really bearing fruit right now. 
The reality is, is that housing counseling agencies across the country are continuing to work with tenants as well as homeowners to recover from the pandemic and also to connect them with programs through Treasury, such as the Emergency Rental Assistance Program and the Homeowners Assistance Fund program out there. And it's making a difference. The fact that we have really sustained home ownership in so many situations is a credit to what the administration has done, as well as industry itself, to work with consumers who are at risk, of course, with regard to mortgages, but also with regard to eviction. Uh, and we couldn't do that without our local and state partners, of course, working so closely with us. When we originally were thinking about the idea of focusing in on Asian American, Pacific and Islander issues with the advisory committee, um, we were very excited when our agencies uh, who we engaged with, including National Capacity, recommended that we consider hosting this meeting here at the Japanese American Museum. And immediately we just said, perfect on so many levels. Because in order to have sound policy moving forward, we also have to understand the roots of every community, the culture of every community that we engage with. And so it's my honor now to introduce Ann Burroughs, who is the president and CEO of the Japanese American uh, National Museum for her welcoming remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you, David. Um, you know, welcome, welcome to you, welcome to the committee. And of course, welcome to all of the, the local leaders, the community leaders who are joining um, from all over the country. Um, you know, it's, it's wonderful to have you here. It's wonderful that you've chosen um, Janum as the location for, for this meeting. Certainly as, the, as we see the incredible rise of um, of unhoused and housing insecurity, not just in Los Angeles, but, but across the country. You know, the work that you do and the work that you do with the community, the work that you do with your partner organizations has never been more important. So, you know, certainly from all of us here, we thank you. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege, it's an honor to have you here. Um, some of you will have gone on, some of you who are in person will have gone on a tour of the museum, so you have some sense of who we are and what we do. But um, for those who don't know, and certainly for the, um, for the folks who are listening, um, Janum is, we're a national museum, the Japanese American National Museum. We were founded almost 30 years ago in order to ensure that the history of what happened to Japanese Americans during the Second World War, the incarceration, is never forgotten, that the stories are never forgotten, that the experiences are never forgotten, but also really importantly, and most importantly, that what happened to Japanese Americans never happens to any other community. So from our very founding, we have a social justice imperative in the way that we look at, at history. We, were also, we also opened on the day of the Los Angeles uprising 31 years ago. So we were formed in that crucible of incredible conflict and division in the city. And that's also been a real element that has focused our work and, and driven our work over all of these years. Um, our focus is to, to tell the Japanese American story, but also to talk about the incredibly rich cultural uh, culture and ethnic diversity in this country and how the Japanese American community has been impacted in that and how we ha how the community has also been able to shape those those major issues um, you know I it's important to know that it was no accident that our museum was built on this place um, for us in the museum community and certainly in the Japanese American community, it is hello ground because just behind us on our plaza, on our museum is where many of the Los Angeles um, Japanese American families were forced to board the buses that took them onto the um, assembly centers and onto the, the confinement sites. So there's enormous power of place at, at, at Janum. Um, and for us here, certainly we see this as being one of those ground zero points in the civil rights history of, of this country. And it's certainly another of those elements that has informed our work. We also have um, at the museum our National Center for the Preservation of Democracy, where we gather people together to talk about issues of, of race, of ethnicity, of 
of identity, of the fragility of democracy, and also really importantly, how Asian America continues to shape democracy. So it's really fitting that you chose to have your meeting here, and we're so grateful to you, and we certainly would welcome you to come back anytime, and certainly for our partners who are in Los Angeles. Um, please don't hesitate to come. Um, we're here, and it's always our privilege to have members of the community come under our roof together to talk about important issues. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you so much, Anne. And, you know, your remarks about the importance of this museum and its location, I will share with you that yesterday while we were visiting many of the communities, the pride in community, the connection with history for all of the leaders who we met with, but I'll also note the ongoing challenges that the community faces from a fair housing perspective clearly resonated, I think, with all of the members of the committee. And of course, I'm going to invite the committee today in our public meeting to share some of their thoughts later. But we have our work ahead of us to continue to affirmatively further fair housing. And all of the HUD staff really look forward to working with you to ensure that these needs in the community, whether it's affordable housing, or whether it's planning for community development is respectful and celebrates the community as a whole. So thank you for joining us today. I'd like to take a moment to also express my appreciation to a leader in the community who could not be with us today, and that is Seema Agnani, who is the CEO of National Capacity. Behind the scenes, leading to this event, she's been meeting relentlessly with our staff to ensure that we would have a very productive and successful meeting today. I also want to uh, acknowledge Joyce Pinsonant for the work that she has done with us, um, and all of the community leaders who work with us and spent their time with us yesterday and today uh, to ensure the success of this first of its kind advisory committee meeting. I also now would like to administer an oath of office, but before I do that, I'd like to recognize and thank all of our leaders in the community who are interested in serving on the Housing Counseling Federal Advisory Committee. Uh, in fact, we had a very large number of applicants for the one open seat that we had. The seat itself was dedicated to housing finance. Uh, uh, as many of you know, when our committee was created, we have representation from uh, those in the housing finance industry, the real estate profession, housing counseling, and the public at large, consumer interests on the committee. And it makes for a very, very dynamic work group with regard to all of the issues that we discussed. Uh, but thank you again to all of those who applied. It was very competitive. But I'm happy to introduce Sherry Eccles to everyone today. And before I administer the oath of office, uh, Sherry, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like you to share a little about your background and why we, uh, in the selection process, were so impressed by you. Okay. <laughs> Thank and you so you much, David. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Sherry Eccles, and I have to say I am thrilled and honored to be here among such incredible company. And I was um, very happy to have the opportunity to apply for this um, group. I've been in the mortgage industry since 1992, and in 1993, after Hurricane Andrew happened in Florida, and I saw the impact that the 203K program had on the people that suffered, um, I was hooked on the power of finance to impact lives, and I went on to um, promote the 203K all over the country, um, also got very involved with Section 184 lending, trying to increase access to homeownership um, financing on um, reservations and um, for tribal members, and uh, then worked for the State of New York Mortgage Agency as the head of their single family homeownership program for about nine years. And during that time is when I really forged my partnerships with housing counseling agencies. Uh, so I was a member of the advisory council of um, New York's coalition of home housing counseling agencies called Home Smart New York. And um, at Sunny May, we require home buyer education and counseling on every transaction. I'm a firm believer that's why the loans um, perform so much better than other portfolios. And um, so I'm a huge advocate of, of this and um, I'm happy to see you know, the, the power of um, mortgage finance programs can change lives. 
when we were, when I was at Sunny May, I launched a minority outreach committee and we were able to increase minority lending at the state level by 10% in more efforts to decrease the racial homeownership gap. And now back in the private sector, um, I co-chair the legislative advocacy and affordable housing committees for the Mortgage Bankers Association, just in an effort again to educate mortgage professionals because as much work as we do on the consumer side, if the professionals don't understand how to connect people with the necessary resources and what's out there and available um, in the toolkit, then they're not able to help people achieve their, their homeownership dreams either. So. so I think everyone can agree we have a very qualified new member, and welcome. If you wouldn't mind standing, let's administer the oath of office and simply repeat after me. I. I. Your name? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend. Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I don't know if I should have first. You're fine, it's all right. <laughs> that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. That I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties of the office. Discharge the duties of the office. On which I'm, I am I'm about to enter. On which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations and Thank welcome. Thank you so much. Wow, National Homeownership Month. What a busy month this has been for the housing counseling community, for HUD. And I'd just like to spend a few minutes highlighting all of the good works that are happening. First, I'd like to introduce to my left, Terry Carr, who is now serving as the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary, Dep Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Housing Counseling. Danbury Carmen, who many of you know, will continue to play a very important role in our office, working to modernize our systems, to pursue our goals and mission. But we are preparing to announce a national, public, as well as internal search at HUD for the Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary position. Uh, and I'm very fortunate that I have the talents of Terry, who is a longtime member of our team, but more significantly, Terry is leading our national public awareness campaign that launched this month. And Terry, if you could just share a few brief remarks about the state of the campaign, which we're very excited about and we briefed you on earlier, but making home the goal, the theme is resonating. Terry? Certainly. So we're just really super excited. I think uh, it has long been on the wish list in the Office of Housing Counseling and in the industry to just really make housing counseling more visible. We think our services are important, that a lot of people benefit from them, and just not enough people know about them. So we launched a campaign beginning in, on June 1st. The idea is to specifically speak to communities who have been historically excluded from home ownership, and we all know how important uh, home ownership is in building wealth, particularly intergenerational wealth in this country. We launched a campaign using paid social media, uh, Facebook ads, Google display ads, radio. We targeted 15 cities in the country, uh, and we have now achieved about 6 million impressions in our ads. We have reached, we think, about 1.2 million individual people in those uh, various cities. We've gotten about 10,000 clicks to our website as a result of that. And uh, all of the display ads drive people to the website so that they can find a housing counselor. What we're hoping to do is raise awareness about the value of housing counseling services. And we really think this is the beginning. This is the first year we have these resources. We'll have them for another five years, possibly longer. We'll continue to talk about pre-purchase counseling, but we also know there's a wide range of services that housing counselors provide. And so we're gonna to start to emphasize some of those other services as the campaign moves forward. And I think the most important thing is just that we want everyone, lenders, realtors, and agencies to join us in distributing the message. I mean, as I've been here the past two days, 
It is extraordinary the work that housing counseling agencies do in their communities, particularly when they're partnering with CDFIs and they're developing real estate. They are the heart of what's happening in terms of increasing access to affordable housing and even developing affordable housing. And so from that perspective, we are committed at OHC to just getting that message out. So we we'll hope you'll join us. We hope the campaign will take on a more organic form uh, as we move forward and that you'll be part of that effort. Thank you, Terry. And it's really terrific because we're seeing the collateral that has been developed beginning to be used by our agencies across the country. And very significantly, a long time ask of our agencies has been to have a decal or logo to celebrate that they are a HUD approved housing counseling organization. And we successfully navigated some of the concerns around use of logo that existed in the past at HUD. And now not only is there one logo, but there are six different designs in different colors for use by our agencies to celebrate that they are a HUD approved housing counseling agency and to use in their marketing across the nation. Our priority right now is marketing the program to potential partners in industry, in government, and elsewhere. And so our staff, Terry and team, have been working to do presentations to really socialize this campaign. And so we do expect it to really take foot or take place it nationwide as our agencies start to socialize and use the campaign, as well as other partners in the public and private sector. I will note that just last week, the entire campaign, all of our collateral, has been translated into additional languages, and we're preparing to share that new information and new collateral uh, with all of our stakeholders as well as we move forward. Uh, as well, uh, you heard a little bit about some of the efforts of the FHA with regard uh, to offering its services in a more accessible way when it comes to language. Just this month, in fact, a series of documents and resources for consumers have been translated into Chinese, Korean, Spanish, Tagalog, and Vietnamese. As we were doing our tour yesterday, in fact, on HUD social media, uh, there was a promotion about the availability of all of these materials in Korean. And this is part of our commitment to reach out and touch these communities so that they're aware of the benefits of not only the FHA mortgage program, but also housing counseling as well. Uh, the availability of these new translated documents is an affirmative step. It's a significant step forward on the part of HUD and FHA to walk the walk rather than simply talk the talk right now. And I congratulate my colleagues in FHA who have worked on this particular aspect of uh, or this initiative to reach individuals with limited English proficiency. Uh, we're gonna continue to market these programs, and I also wanna note that the materials are also available with regard to serving as resources to avoid foreclosure, to, uh, to deal with disaster relief, and other recovery options. It's quite holistic, the approach that's being taken right now. Just this week, FHA announced that it will be adopting the Supplemental Consumer Information Form. This is also a very significant step forward. The form, which is voluntary, but will be mandated by HUD for use in its programs, is also being used by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as a result of FHFA action, and it will capture information voluntarily offered by consumers on language access, what their language preference is. That's going to be very helpful as we continue to strive to meet the needs of every consumer who is interested in home ownership across the country. But also, very notably, it captures information on housing counseling, HUD-approved housing counseling agencies, and home ownership education. So now as we move forward and we're modernizing systems, I hope that we'll see in a few years that we're gonna have much more robust data, but more significantly be able to follow consumers in their home ownership journey. You know, they become homeowners, but what if they begin to struggle with their mortgage? I hope in time that housing counseling agencies will be part of a safety net where they can follow up with consumers if they may be experiencing a difficulty, which of course in life is always going to happen, whether it's illness, unemployment, it could be divorce, and so on. It could be, God forbid, you know, what we experienced during the pandemic. Counseling plays a critical role in sustaining home ownership. 
So the Supplemental Consumer Information Form is going to be a wonderful new tool, and there's some information available on HUD.gov if you're interested in learning about it. Of course, last week as well, we awarded the Supplemental Grant, the Comprehensive Housing Grant Program, to 160 plus organizations to continue to do their good works, <laughs> as well as to agencies that were not funded in the previous round. But we're still moving forward. We're already planning for the next NOFO, and I'm very excited to share with you that in the very near future, we are going to be publishing in the, publishing in the Federal Register very detailed information in advance of our new Comprehensive Housing Counseling Homeownership Initiative. This is a new initiative. You've heard me reference it. This initiative will be funding pre- and post-purchase housing counseling in communities that are where we're really focusing on to address the home ownership gap that realize new mortgage origination. Mortgage origination will be required. But for the first time, HUD will be negotiating with intermediaries and also state housing finance agencies to establish a fixed price for the service. Now, this is going to have profound impact because one, it's gonna simplify reporting for agencies. Two, as well, it's going to enable us to collect very meaningful data on the impact of our work. Who is realizing home ownership? What census tracts? Where are they moving from and to? What type of mortgage products? What are the demographics of the consumers so that we can really celebrate? There's been an absence of data in this space. Celebrate the impact of pre- and post-purchase housing counseling. There will also be another profound impact. Many of you are familiar with RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedure Act. Some lenders who are very interested in pursuing pre-purchase counseling using a fee-for-service basis have been hesitant because of what's called Section 8 concerns in regard to pre-contracting with agencies and providing a fee-for-service. In essence, what we are doing at HUD is we are negotiating and establishing a market rate with our agencies that we feel will be reasonable. Under RESPA, HUD establishing a market rate will resolve the Section 8 issue moving forward. And it's our hope that we will see a dramatic increase, take pre- and post-purchase counseling to scale in the way that we hope that we all want to see it so that not only is the public sector focused on bridging the home ownership gap, but all of the new programs, such as special purpose mortgage programs, expanded and augmented down payment assistance programs, as well as some of the traditional Community Reinvestment Act programs, can go to scale in a very meaningful way. So look for that information in the Federal Register. We're doing it a little differently because we want to allow people time to understand this new initiative, and then subsequently the NOFO will be published. We really want people to be very, we want to be very transparent, and we want people also have the time to ask any questions about this new approach. Uh, we are also uh, really excited. We just held our first regional conference. It's really a me regional meeting for agencies. It was held in Chicago. Uh, Jerry Mayer is somewhere in the room. Congratulations, Jerry, to you and your team. Jerry is the director of our Office of Capacity Building. We had over 100 folks in the room, and we focused in on issues of the day, both an update of all that's happening in our space, but all looking, also looking at the issue of valuation and responsible appraisal, talking about the PAVE initiative, talking about current home ownership and rental issues in the Midwest region, the Chicago region. But then we partnered with the FDIC, and we had a really great afternoon work session where we had representatives from the FDIC, but more significantly, regional banks in the room to network with our agencies so that they could explore home ownership partnerships together, modeling on some of the programs I just referenced, where banks, mortgage originators, and in fact, housing counseling organizations are doing very focused outreach to realize and expand access to credit in their communities. We're gonna be doing seven more of these programs. The next one will be in San Francisco, coming up, I believe, in August. We'll be outreaching to all of our agencies. It's a by invitation event, but we really hope that you'll join us at the HUD regional office in San Francisco. 
And then we have plans to do them across the country over the coming year and a half. Uh, it's going very well. People really thought very highly of the program. The HUD Handbook is a, uh, often an inquiry I receive from our, our stakeholders. Of course, um, we've been talking about the update to the handbook. I'm happy to share with you that the HUD Handbook is complete. And more significantly, over the past few months, the work on the FAQs for practitioners is also complete. We are in final clearance, and I expect, uh, I hope it will be uh, during the month of August. It could be earlier, it depends on our HUD internal clearance process. But we have sort of pre-vetted this with all the critical offices. It's my hope that we will be publishing in the coming weeks this very significant and I will add streamlined document that I think everyone's going to really enjoy reviewing. Our plan is to do a series of webinars for the housing counseling community, for housing counselors in particular, but I think executive directors and program coordinators should also attend. It's going to be a very informative briefing, and we look forward to rolling this out. And we've just opened registration for our national virtual community conference. We're moving from August to September. We're doing that very much by design. And we've, been, we've, we've been very pleased with the participation over the past two years. Uh, again, we've made a choice. We're going to continue the virtual program because so many housing counselors on a local level really enjoy participating. Uh, we want, you know, ideally, I hope we could have 5,000 folks uh, on the virtual call. We've been averaging about 1,300, 1,400 each year. Uh, and that's terrific. Uh, and so we're going to continue with the three-day virtual program. Uh, and registration has just opened. You can get a sense of the program on uh, the uh, HUD Exchange site right now. We're beginning to market it through our broadcasts. And I hope as well everyone has been enjoying Housing Counseling Today, our new blog format of a newsletter. Uh, the response has been very favorable. favorable. You know, the updates, the articles are fresh, they're current. Uh, we'll be celebrating our work here, of course, on housing counseling today. Uh, close to 30,000 people are really uh, taking advantage of it. And if you're not on the list for that, I invite you to go to the HUD Exchange and become part of it. So I, I uh, also just want to close by talking a little bit about rulemaking before we move forward with the agenda. Uh, many of you know that we've been very actively involved with tribal rulemaking. This is acting on the Dodd-Frank legislation that created our office over a decade ago. Uh, and more significantly, we have been very engaged with the Office of Native American Programs. We have done two tribal consultations. We've been doing listening sessions. We issued a proposed rule. We have received significant and very thoughtful comment to that rule. And prior to issuing a final rule, which I expect will be later this calendar year, we are doing one more tribal consultation. And that is about to be announced. It will be occurring in July. Uh, we'll be doing one consultation. Uh, but already, we're planning for it, and we're looking forward to conducting it. So we expect to have a final rule in place, again, this year. Uh, I'll add that's overdue. But I really want to say thank you to all of our partners who have been helping us in this space. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge the role of our advisory committee and our members uh, in also helping us to spread the word about this important programming. Equally significantly, I think we all can acknowledge the practice of housing counseling has changed. Just like the practice of real estate and housing finance, technology has changed our world. It's promoted great efficiencies and as well opportunities for us to engage with consumers. We've learned during the financial crisis and the pandemic that the way housing counselors are engaging with consumers and offering their sessions, of course face-to-face -face is very common and still very much the norm, but so is telephonic and virtual sessions. And I want to thank this committee because you gave us tremendous feedback at our last meeting on your thoughts about delivery of services. We have also been engaging with all of our stakeholders, inviting comments, and we are very close to issuing a proposed rule to update our requirement for in-person face-to-face counseling. As you know, a waiver has been in place. It is going to expire at the end of this calendar year in December. 
It is our goal to have a new rule proposed and acted upon within the calendar year. And I think you, you, I'll share with you that you can look for that proposed rule in the very near future from the Office of Housing Counseling and HUD. And of course, we invite your feedback, but I suspect our stakeholders are gonna be very pleased with the content because we listen to our stakeholders. And I think we have a very strong path forward. So uh, with that, I will conclude my updates. Uh, I'd like to ask if any members of the committee have any questions about any of the updates that I've provided. <clears throat> okay. So um, it's my uh, honor, actually, to introduce uh, leaders uh, uh, in uh, HUD and are also the administration uh, who are going to uh, speak about some of our administration's priorities. Bear with me one moment while I call up my document again. In particular, with regard to the White House Initiative on Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander priorities. There is an acronym there, but I'm not brave enough to try to share it. I will defer to our guests. We have uh, Deanna Jang, who is the policy director of the Pacific Islander American Health Forum with us. Welcome, thank you for joining us today. And we also have Cheng Shu, who is uh, also affiliated with HUD and a colleague, and look, we look forward to both of your remarks. Thank you, Deanna, please. <coughs> Oh, hi. Can you hear me? We can now. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Deanna Jang, and um, I serve as the policy director for the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, or um, as stated, we call it YOMP. Um, it took me, I just started this uh, position in February, so it's taken me that long to <laughs> practice that acronym. Um, I want to thank HUD for inviting uh, me to address uh, your meeting of the Federal Advisory Committee and congratulate you for convening um, this committee. Um, is, I'm sorry, is someone going to show the PowerPoint presentations? Let's check on that. Okay, well, I will go on. Um, just to mention that since his first day in office, uh, President Biden made it clear that's a priority of his administration to advance equity for underserved communities, including Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. And over the past two and a half years, the Biden-Harris administration has been working tirelessly um, to achieve, to deliver on this promise. As many of you know, in May 2021, President Biden signed Executive Order 14031 to reestablish and reinvigorate the White House initiative. And, the, and I'm proud to say that this initiative's name and scope was expanded to di distinctively recognize Native Hawaiians. Hence, now we're called Wyampi, whereas in prior administrations, we were called Wyampi. Um, since Wyampi establishment during the Clinton administration in 1999, our greatest strength has always been our unique ability to do two things connect with our communities where they are and pursue progress across the federal government on issues impacting our diverse communities, including promoting um, uh, health and educational and equity across uh, government programs. We do this through on the ground engagement with our regional network, collaboration through our federal interagency working group and the leadership of the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Together, these three parts of Wyampi work in sync to ensure that we are responsive to the needs of diverse AA and NHPI communities across the country and can mobilize during times of need. And we're able to work effectively with dozens of federal agency partners, including HUD, um, to share resources and to improve best practices. So when President Biden reestablished YMP, he provided us with an expanded and ambitious mandate in totaling 14 different issue areas and including seven strategic priorities. Our efforts have focused on tackling the most immediate crises facing A and NHPI communities as we recover from the pandemic, but we've also made historic strides 
when it comes to expanding the collection and use of disaggregated data and reducing language barriers. In all, we're working together to center equity, justice, and opportunity for all people. And we've been laser focused on building back in a manner that promotes resiliency and healing. And we've already seen the results of our efforts. So for example, in January, the Biden administration released our first ever national strategy to address the needs of AA and NHPI communities. This strategy represents a historic milestone for our communities, summarizing our shared progress over the past two years in addressing key disparities and laying out a blueprint that we will guide our continuing coordination across the federal government over the next two years. We've also launched a series of regional economic summits to connect community members with federal resources and opportunities. We've met with AA and NHPI business owners and entrepreneurs during our travels to Philadelphia, Chicago, New York City, and Seattle. And I'm really excited to share with you that our next stop of the series um, next week is uh, we'll be in Honolulu um, and we'll be having an economic summit there as well as having a meeting of our president's advisory commission. Uh, commission. That engagement is also historic as it marks the commission's first meeting outside of the US mainland and underscores our commitment to supporting and learning from indigenous knowledge and practices, um, as well as thinking about our kuleana, how we can responsibly care for our lands, culture, and people. And um, overall, Wyompi continues to address barriers to prosperity by ensuring that AA and NHPI communities can access federal programs and services in an equitable ma manner. So just a few of our accomplishments. Um, during May, um, we held um, our a White House forum, it was the largest one um, that's been held uh, since the Obama administration, uh, where we brought together um, uh, federal employees, um, cabinet members, uh, members of the community, community leaders, entertainment, uh, entertainers, et cetera, um, to uh, under the theme of visible together. And we drew more than 1300 community members from over two dozen states and US territories as making it one of the largest in-person events ever hosted by uh, the Biden-Harris administration in celebration of A and NHPI Heritage Month. We also held um, a federal workforce conference, a historic conference focusing on supporting Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander federal employees and cultivating leaders within the federal government. Um, marking the first time the event has been held at the scale and any administration, again, since 2014. Um, I mentioned our economic summits, and we've also held several um, summits on data equity to improve the collection of Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander um, data. Um, I do want to give time to my, uh, my colleague, Chang, uh, to really do a deep dive into um, HUD's plan. We have action plans from 35 agencies on how they're going to move forward on implementing um, the national strategy of, of our administration. And there you'll get more details into what we're doing in the housing area. Thank you. Deanna, thank you so much. And Chang, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, David. Um, I hope everyone can hear me and see the screen and slides. Um, my name is Chang Chu. I'm a senior policy advisor in HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak today um, at this historic meeting of the advisory committee um, and, and focusing on AA and NHPI issues. I'd like to thank the partnership that uh, my office, FHEO, has with the Office of Housing Counseling um, at HUD. And I'd also like to thank uh, Deanna Jang, uh, who you just heard from, for her partnership um, in working on important policies across the federal government um, for the AA and NHPI community. So I 
wear multiple hats at HUD. Uh, one of them is uh, working in the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity or FHEO. And one of the other hats is representing HUD as uh, one of our liaisons to WIAMPI. Um, there is a, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. There is a uh, interagency working group that uh, Deanna helps convene, uh, made up of the 35 agencies that contributed to the national strategy. Um, and uh, several members from HUD are uh, staffing a lot of those meetings and, and interactions with WIAMPI. Um, Deanna mentioned uh, Executive Order 14031. Uh, this is the EO that um, we launched the WIAMPI structure. Um, in this administration. Um, and she mentioned there that there are 14 policy goals for the interagency working group. I wanted to highlight for you all um, one of the policy goals that concerns housing. Um, and it's up there on the screen for you. Um, as you can see, one of the uh, priorities for an executive order involves um, in centers around HUD's work, HUD's work in housing counseling, FHEO, other offices, um, in, in getting at uh, access to opportunities in housing for AA and NHPI communities. So I wanted, wanted to note that the EO itself calls on um, the federal government and, and HUD to do all it can uh, for, for the community. Deanna in her presentation also mentioned um, the, the multiple strategic priority areas that are mentioned in, in the EO. Um, three of them have uh, subcommittees uh, within the interagency working group that HUD also participates in. And these are the three uh, that you see on the screen right now. Um, I wanted to go through each of these so that you all can understand why these are so important for the AA and NHPI community and for HUD to participate in. Um, first deals with anti-Asian hate, discrimination, inclusion, and belonging. Um, there have been, uh, since the, the COVID pandemic, um, increased incidents of hate and bias incidents against the AA and NHPI community. And so what this subcommittee is attempting to do is uh, create an all government response on um, increasing awareness of resources that can combat this type of bias and discrimination. Um, the second subcommittee deals with that at the segregation. Um, and as Deanna mentioned, this is an important issue for the EA and NHPI community. And this is recognition that that it's disaggregation can lead to better policymaking um, and recognition that the AA and NHPI community isn't a monolith. Um, and that's important to recognize when we're designing policy. The third subcommittee deals with language access for AA and NHPIs. And this is work to recognize that many AA and NHPI individuals are limited English proficient or LEP, and we have to design um, avenues to uh, allow these communities to also access um, federal government opportunities. And I'll get uh, into this a little bit more um, a little bit later. Second slide, please. So, HUD's action plan. Um, in Deanna's presentation, she mentioned the national strategy that WIAPI has uh, created and that the White House uh, published. Um, this strategy was published in January of this year. Um, and as Deanna mentioned, 35 agencies were asked to contribute actions and commitments to this action plan, or to this national strategy rather. Um, and HUD was proud to contribute. Um, and we chose at HUD to focus on five actions in our action plan. And these are the five um, areas that you see on the slide. And so I'll, I'll, I'll go over um, a bit about what each of these actions uh, is intended to cover. So on language access, as we were talking about, um, the issue and barrier that we are trying to address at HUD is that a third of the AA and NHPI population is limited English proficient. And language access has been documented as a significant barrier in accessing housing programs. Low and moderate income and underserved AA and NHPI families have limited access to culturally sensitive and linguistically appropriate information to access affordable housing. And so there's a lack of exposure, familiarity with, and understanding of AA and NHPI communities among HUD grantees. And this prevents effective and equitable provision of HUD services and programs. So how are we going to remedy this and how are we going to attack this challenge? 
HUD has committed in our action plan to WIAMPI to ensure that there's language access throughout HUD's programs and services. And we're going to do this through implementation of the department's language access plan um, and providing language services that provide translations that ensure vital and public facing documents are translated into frequently used A and um, NHPI languages, as well as on-demand interpretation when, when calling HUD. And I'd also like to shout out um, the work that the Office of Housing Counseling has done with its telephonic tool in ensuring that we have um, coverage of over 200 languages through, through the telephonic tool to, to reach housing counselors that are HUD approved. Um, our second uh, action, which I'm not gonna dwell on very much because that's actually the focus of your meeting today, this is access to housing opportunities. Um, and this is, the, this is the issue that you're all digging into today um, and central to this, this action is the work of our housing counseling colleagues and the grants and programs uh, that they run to ensure that uh, communities of color, including the AA and NHPI community, can get access to all the housing opportunities that are afforded to them um, at, at HUD. Um, that is the segregation. Uh, Deanna mentioned it a bit. Um, the issue that we're trying to remedy here is that the Asian racial category is largely treated as a monolith in analyzing housing outcomes and extreme diversity between AA and NHPI communities. So this diversity is not always reflected when we design programs and implement policy. And this includes um, differing outcomes when it comes to the data uh, in AA and NHPI subgroups. HUD's commitment in this area is to deploy our Office of Policy Development and Research to explore data disaggregation efforts to better understand the unique housing needs of AA and NHPI subgroups and better target housing resources based on those needs. Um, our fourth action deals with the Native Hawaiian housing programs that are run by HUD. Um, and our commitment here is to strengthen um, that diversity of housing programs that are available for Native Hawaiian families. And just as a bit of context, the issue and challenge that we're trying to get at with this action is that HUD has a native Hawaiian housing block grant program. And this block grant program has traditionally only funded housing ownership programs. HUD's sole grantee in this program is the state of Hawaii's Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Um, and this grantee has been interested in expanding its work to affordable rental housing projects so HUD's commitment on this action is to train um, the state of Hawaii to develop and operate affordable rental housing projects, specifically for mixed use housing and permanent supportive housing, um, and to create regulatory uh, proposals that would allow HUD to provide more technical assistance to this grantee for purposes of building capacity to develop and operate affordable rental housing. And lastly, um, our last action deals with federal workforce diversity. We recognize that um, we need to do a better job at HUD of raising awareness of HUD workforce opportunities among AA and NHPI stakeholder groups. Um, and it's important to have a workforce that reflects America. And that's in, that includes the needs of our AA and NHPI communities. So our commitment here is to increase recruitment activities, engaging AA and NHPI stakeholder groups. To go to the third slide. So I wanted to talk a bit um, about HUD's accomplishments um, coming out of the national strategy commitments. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll be brief here because um, I think my time is running out, but just to highlight a few things uh, quickly, the Federal Housing Administration, this includes the Office of Housing Counseling, um, has serviced and helped A and HPI clients um, over the last couple of fiscal years. and. and going back uh, many years. And we just wanted to highlight for you the number of AA and HPI clients um, that have been served by housing counseling agencies, um, as well as the number of clients um, who received mortgage payment forbearance over the last two years, um, largely because of, of the pandemic. Um, not included on this slide um, uh, are the FHA mortgage insurance that was um, facilitating affordable home financing or refinancing for over 55,000 AA and NHPI individuals over the last two fiscal years. In our native Hawaiian programs, um, we've allocated over 55, or $5 million um, under the American Rescue Plan for the native Hawaiian housing block grant program. Um, and there's over 22 million in fiscal year 20, 
to uh, budgets that is going out the door right now. Um, go to the next slide. And this is my final slide. I just wanted to highlight a couple other accomplishments that HUD has done. So my office, the Office of Fair Housing, we have funded a National Capacities Fair Housing Campaign that translated public service announcements into 15A and NHPI languages. Um, and I want to shout out Seema Agnani, who's, who's with you today, I believe, um, for the great work um, in, in her organization um, in partnership with the Housing Counseling Office and with FHEO. Um, FHEO is open for business on fair housing complaints. As you can see, we provide conciliation agreements that result from people bringing fair housing complaints who are AA and NHPI. Um, and we have allocated funding to nonprofits to address housing discrimination as well. And on data, um, we've spoken about that a bit, but I'll just uh, highlight one thing for you, which is um, the, the Office of Policy Development and Research released an article just last month about national housing trends for AA and NHPI communities that's available online. Um, and it gets into some of the data disaggregation that, that we've mentioned. So I will stop there. Um, I, I hope um, you just got a picture of what HUD is doing um, in coordination with Huyampi and everything that we're doing and committed to doing for the AA and NHPI community. But thank you very much. Back to you, David. Jang, thank you very much. And that sets the stage for a robust conversation moving from the national level to what's happening locally in our communities. I also want to acknowledge and express my appreciation to the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. We have a very close working relationship with FHEO, uh, and we're focused on a host of issues to ensure that every consumer can live in the community of their choice free from housing discrimination. As we begin to set up for what will be our first panel discussion, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge that we do have members of the committee who are participating virtually today and just wanna invite them, um, if they're available, I'll check with uh, our tech and uh, experts, uh, uh, I know that we've had Richard Virilio and Carol Dujanovich. I'm not sure if we have any other else who has joined since we opened the meeting, but if we could just allow them to say a few words, and I just wanna let you know that I'm going to try to engage you throughout our conversation today, uh, even though you're participating virtually. Wonderful, I see Carol, welcome Carol. Can you hear us? Carol, if they're telling me that you're muted, can you unmute? I can barely hear you. Okay, I'll, I'll try to get closer to the microphone. I, I'm just welcoming you to the meeting and letting you know that we're gonna invite you to participate virtually. Uh, she's having, we're having an IT issue. Okay, so we'll try to solve that, okay? Uh, why don't we try to see if Richard's available? <laughs> okay, anyone else from the committee? Marsha's there? Great, so we'll turn to Marsha Lewis. Hello, Marsha, can you hear me? Now I can. Um, I don't think any of us could hear you for quite a while. Um, so I don't know what you ask us to do. No, no, no. Except really? for Marcia, thank <laughs> introduce you. Just, ourselves, <laughs> maybe. Uh, just, w just welcoming you and letting you know that we they're still having a problem hearing. Okay, so I'll ask our IT team to try to solve this issue for our members who are online, and we'll circle back. Okay, just we'll circle back to you. Okay, so allow us to move forward while we solve that IT issue. Uh, we're actually going to move into our first panel discussion. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. And Angie, I believe, Angie Liu, a member of our committee, will be queuing up our conversation today. Great. Th thank you, David. Um, so I'm Angie Liu. Um, I'm a member of the um, Housing Counseling at Federal Advisory uh, Council. Um, I also um, serve on the board of uh, National Capacity. Um, I just want to open up um, very briefly this conversation just um, 
bringing um, my own experience of um, having worked at uh, my organization, the Asian Community Development Corporation in Boston's Chinatown for the past 10 years. Um, that experience, um, you know, on this count, uh, council, I'm representing the real estate industry. So my organization, um, we serve um, primarily the low and moderate income uh, Asian Americans in the greater Boston region um, through um, affordable housing development, home ownership education, financial literacy, um, as well as placekeeping and re resident engagement programs to make sure that uh, people feel a sense of belonging in the places they choose to call home. So um, as David uh, mentioned earlier, the uh, Advisory Council was able to go on a bus tour of uh, quite a few local Asian American communities here in Los Angeles. A lot of the challenges that were brought up definitely resonated with what we are seeing in the Boston region as well. Um, I think what we heard um, yesterday is that um, many of the Asian communities tend to be in high cost cities, high cost areas, which creates a lot of challenges in access to both rental housing as well as homeownership opportunities. So um, in these high cost areas, um, that gentrification pressure and threat of displacement um, means that these uh, ethnic communities often have to fight for their very own uh, survival. Um, and I think um, it's good to remind ourselves that in the rise of uh, anti-Asian racism in the last few years, it is all the more important um, for these communities to continue to thrive and survive because they provide important uh, safe havens and communities um, for these uh, uh, Asian American immigrants. Um, so some of the challenges in um, rental and homeownership uh, housing that we see um, in terms of uh, addressing those challenges in, 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 in our own work um, besides housing counseling, homeownership education um, in Asian languages. Um, someone earlier mentioned down payment assistance. We also do our own match savings programs to help try to close that gap. But often what we see um, in terms of the access to homeownership, all the homeownership education, um, down payment assistance can still not close that gap um, so, which is why we are also very engaged locally in the building and development of new affordable homeownership opportunities. Um, most of the projects that we have been involved in building are rental, but more and more recently we are getting uh, much more involved in the building of affordable uh, condos so that um, people have a real chance of being able to become first time home buyers. So with that, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Joyce because Seema Agnani unfortunately could not be with us today. Great, thank you Angie. And just thank you so much to uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Berenbaum and the Advisory Committee for inviting National Capacity to partner with you on this event today. Um, I've just really enjoyed spending the last day with you touring um, Asian American neighborhoods here in LA. And just like you, I learned so much. And you know, I, I really thought that this morning, um, what I tried to do is more set the table for the panels that are going to be coming up um, throughout today. And so what I'd like to do is actually talk about some of the trends and some of the data that I think would be helpful to your understanding the context of um, of what's happening in our communities. So just uh, in each of you should have received a small packet from National Capacity and maybe I'll just start off by saying a little bit about National Capacity. Um, so National Capacity, we're a national coalition of approximately 100 member organizations across the country. We're in 22 different states and our members really represent a, a broad array of community-based organizations that are multi-service agencies, community organizing groups, um, 
community development and affordable housing developers, small business development organizations, youth development. They really do comprehensive community development um, in the places where Asian American communities are emerging or have the highest concentrations of low-income populations. And in many ways, our membership are serving the most vulnerable within the Asian American community. Um, we, our, our membership speaks approximately 40 different Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander languages. So it's really an impressive group of organizations. So I, I wanted to just spend a minute talking a little bit about our HUD Housing Counseling Network, too. Um, we are the first and only HUD Housing Counseling Intermediary that is specifically focused on serving the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community. Um, over time, the size of our network has really ebbed and flowed. Um, we are currently at 12 housing counseling agencies within our network who we pass through funds to as sub-grantees. Uh, Additionally, we have four organizations that are in the pipeline to become HUD housing counseling agencies within our network. And I'll just say that there are a number of other organizations that are also part of National Capacities Coalition and membership that are also local housing counseling agencies but may receive funding from other um, intermediaries or directly from HUD. So it's a, it's a really good uh, mixture of groups who bring a great deal of expertise. So um, one of the things I wanted to point out is that you've all received a report called Crisis to Impact. That is a report that uh, we completed and released in 2021. It was done in partnership with uh, UCLA. And what this study showed is that our network of housing counseling agencies are really serving the lion's share of Asian Americans in their region. So in some cases, um, our agencies were serving almost 100% of Asian American clients within their region. And a lot of that has to do with the language and cultural competency that these organizations have built up over the decades of their service to the communities that they work in. Um, I also wanted to note that in the report, uh, we found that a significantly higher percentage of clients served by our network members are limited English proficient. I think it's something like 67%. So it's a very high percentage. And also, um, they were significantly lower income as compared to other organizations, uh, I'm sorry, as compared to other HCAs and who they were serving. So um, in the packet that I have, I, I wanted to just point out slide three, which is um, an overview of where the poorest, or I should say where there's the highest concentration of Asian American poverty. So as Angie mentioned, um, there are about two million Asian Americans living in poverty here in the United States. And what's interesting about our community is that this, this poverty is very concentrated. In fact, it's concentrated in about 10 metropolitan statistical areas, and that represents about 50% of all AA and HPIs living in poverty. And you can see just by looking at the list, these are, as Angie said, the highest cost cities in the US. So, um, what this means is that our communities are disproportionately at risk for displacement as compared to other racial and ethnic groups in the U.S. So um, looking at the data a different way, we know that 53% of AA and NHPIs live in just 15 MSAs, where the median monthly rents are above the U.S. median. So um, as many of you heard yesterday on the tour, many cities like, the, like L.A. are fighting displacement at a pace which is um, occurring so quickly, it's actually incredibly difficult to fight it. So it's, um, as we heard yesterday, virtually impossible to build our way out of this challenge um, at the pace that it needs to happen. And so it's partially because of the complexity and the expense of building new construction. Um, but this, what this really highlights is the importance of acquisition and preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing as well as investing in the improvement of conditions in existing affordable housing, such as Cathay Manor, which we had the opportunity to drive by yesterday during our tour. Uh, I also just wanted to highlight that for many in our communities, as you also heard yesterday, fighting displacement is not just about keeping people in their homes. It's about preserving a sense of place and culture. Our members work to retain the cultural fabric that's so important to the residents and a larger constituency of folks who live in the region because this is where people come for services, resources, businesses, events, and community. And these are not places where you can find it anywhere else. 
So I'll move quickly through the next few slides. I did just want to um, you know, note that um, when we look and think about sort of the rent burden that is faced by members within our community, slide five is really just showing you, if, as you look at rent burden by race, you know, the national US average is about 51.1%. You can see that for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, the rent burden is higher. Um, it's 54%. For Asian Americans, the percentage seems lower. But actually, um, as we heard from uh, the representative from HUD, you know, data disaggregation is really important. Once we disaggregate the data, what we start to see is that actually certain Asian subpopulations are significantly at risk of displacement. For example, Bangladeshis, about 57% um, face significant rent burden. <clears throat> and what this means is they're paying more than 30% of their income for their rent. Um, similarly, on, on mortgage burden, one of the things that we see is that for both Asian and NHPI communities, the mortgage burden is higher than the U.S. average, which is about 27 or 28 percent. For Asians, it's 32, and for NHPIs, it's 34 percent. And again, when we, when we disaggregate that data, we see that certain subpopulations, again, are more at risk for having a uh, significant mortgage burden. So again, for Bangladeshis, it's actually closer to 48.4%. And for Tongans, um, it's actually 45%. So on slide nine, I just wanted to point out through our own research, again, referring to the crisis to impact report, one of the things that we did was take a look at um, what were some of the barriers to home ownership for our communities. What we found was that some mortgage denials were mostly due to debt to income ratio and credit history. What this really lifted up to us was this opportunity to really invest more in financial education, financial coaching for our communities. So, um, you know, I think just to sort of recap what we have heard over the last few days is that for many in our communities, um, they are more, many of those within the Asian American and NHPI communities, they are more likely to be renters due to the challenges of achieving home ownership. In fact, one in four Asian renters are severely cost burdened, spending more than 50% of their household income on housing. Um, we do know that for Asian households, severely cost burden households are six times more likely to be limited English proficient. So we're looking at the confluence of not just low income, but also limited English proficiency that makes it a challenge to access resources. Um, within our community, we're also more likely to be multi-generational and live in hard, larger households. Um, one last thing that we wanted to make sure we lifted up is that for our community, um, actually internet accessibility and computer literacy is a major barrier to accessing services. That became incredibly clear during the pandemic. And so um, one, one of the things that we're seeing now that the pandemic has officially come to an end is that our community still faces significant need. And, um, you know, we found that uh, during, the, um, during the pandemic, many within our community were disproportionately impacted and faced challenges, in fact, in accessing um, uh, emergency rental assistance. And so uh, this was particularly true for elderly, elderly and limited English proficient communities. And so, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to lift up is that it is really important to invest in local community-based organizations who can help to be those navigators and connector, connectors to the resources that we know are available. So I'm gonna shift us to talking as part of our panel, um, but I, I did want to just spend a minute to say, you know, we are so lucky to be here in HUD Region 9. And one of the things that we know is that HUD Region 9 um, about 38% of all AA and NHPIs in the U.S. live in this region. That's a huge percentage. 30% of AA and NHPIs live in California alone. And so we're very fortunate to have this opportunity to really learn so deeply about the experiences that are probably pretty reflective of the experiences of AA and NHPIs across the country. So. Um, one of the things that I wanted to lift up in order to transition is that um, if you look at slide 14, there's a slide that says HUD Region 9 NHPI alone slash combination. And um, I, I just wanted to lift up that um, this chart is really showing us 
what um, renter and home ownership rates look like for the NHPI community within HUD Region 9. And I'm choosing to focus on this slide because we're about to transition into this discussion about uh, NHPI communities. Um, I did want to say that um, Carla Thomas, one of our speakers, was unable to make it today due to some travel um, challenges, but um, I, I am confident that our panel here representing the state of Hawaii will give you a tremendous amount of information to chew on. Um, what I really just wanted to highlight in this particular slide is that you can see that you know the national rate for homeownership is approximately 65%, I believe. And when you look at this chart, you can see that for NHPI communities, it is quite a bit lower um, and significantly higher rates of renters. And what when you look at the on the very bottom of that slide, it shows you within certain states, if you look at certain subpopulations, Samoans, for example, are consistently higher rates as renters, Tongans as well. And so, um, you know, I just really wanted to, again, underline the importance of data disaggregation and understanding that specific members of our community are really in significant need. So I, I'm not going to go through the rest of the handout, but I did just want to point there are subsequent slides that actually point out multiple metropolitan statistical areas and information that you can take a look at. And I think what I'm going to do is actually just um, turn it over to my wonderful colleagues here, and I'll just briefly introduce them. Um, I have Chelsea Evans here. She's the executive director of Hawaiian Community Assets, um, Leona Hosea. She's a housing counselor with the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement, and Paige Onishi, who's the Chief Operating Officer for Council of Native Hawaiian Advancement. And I actually just really want to thank them. All of them flew in from Hawaii to be here today because they felt it was an important opportunity to have face time with you and really share their experiences. Joyce, thank you so much. And yeah. first, the data you shared and the insights are very, very helpful. And thank you to our leaders from Hawaii, aloha, for joining us. And uh, we really appreciate that you really made the effort to come to LA for our meeting today. So thank you so much. I, I'm going to ask everyone as we move forward through the panels to try to respond to one question because I asked my team to pull our housing counseling, you know, 9902 data, um, <laughs> in advance of the meeting, and year to date, there have only been 20,000 sessions in the AAPI community. And we heard the numbers annually presented uh, by our colleague before. That is completely unacceptable to me. Um, and I know I'm really looking forward, we all are looking forward to hearing your remarks, but if you have the opportunity to share a recommendation or a thought on how we can do better to reach more consumers in every aspect of our work, I invite you to share that with us, please. Thanks, David. So, uh, Chelsea, are you up first? Sure. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so, Chelsea Evans, born and raised um, in Hawaii on the island of Maui, um, up in Makawao. Um, a little bit of history of myself, um, I was a teen mom, I actually was a Section 8 voucher holder for my, uh, most of my, my 20s. Um, later in some of my first work was a HUD housing counselor. Um, when I bought my first home, I did go through one of our HUD um, housing counseling agencies to get my homeowners workshop and the now executive director of Hawaiian Community Assets which is the largest HUD certified organization in Hawaii. Um, we serve the entire state of, of Hawaii, um, and we were created specific, can you, you need me to talk louder? <laughs> we were created specifically um, for Native Hawaiians after our founders attempted to be able to secure housing through Department of Hawaiian Homelands, um, which has, a really, really, really long waiting list that many Hawaiians die waiting for their opportunity to receive a Department of Hawaiian Homelands lease, which is a 99-year lease. Our founders um, who waited on that wait list for over 10 years showed up to their appointment with all of their documents to be told within five minutes that they would not receive their land because they did not have the credit score and the credit history needed. So Hawaiian Community Assets was created to be able to provide um, 
that education to Native Hawaiians. Now, as a HUD certified organization, we serve all. Although we were created for Native Hawaiians and our primary goal is for Native Hawaiians, because we're a HUD certified organization, we serve all of the population. Um, to answer the question of how can we serve more people, I've been executive director now for about a year and a half, and there's a question that keeps coming up for me, is why do we keep continuing to be a HUD certified org? Because we don't get enough funding really to do it. I can get more funds from private funders. The paperwork is, is costs us a lot of money to do. I'm still trying to figure out why that, how that outweighs what we do. Sometimes I feel like we serve people less because of the restrictions that are needed. Um, the requirements of HUD on our clients is a lot to ask um, for a population who has been displaced from their land where the culture was taken. For HUD housing councils to come in and say, I need your bank statements, I need all of your financial information, right at, right at the beginning for intake is cold and very different from our culture. It takes us a long time to build a relationship with people um, that we can't bill for um, with HUD because it, we don't actually complete intake until we have the solid relationship built that sometimes can take months. Um, that, that right there is kind of one of the key pieces that we're still trying to figure out. You know, we have to go to private funders and explain the situation to them to say, well, I can't bill somebody until we check these boxes. But the reality is that we have um, Native Hawaiians who do not trust the government, do not, you know, rightfully so. Um, and so we have to play that, that in between to build a relationship with them, but there's no funds for that. I don't, you know, I don't know how to put that down <laughs> in something that, that makes sense for federal funding. So I would say that would be kind of at the top of the list, that question. Thank you for sharing that insight. And it, it, it's a tension that we have heard before because even during the pandemic, with so many people approaching housing counseling organizations for assistance, simply to apply for treasury support. Um, there was a requirement, not in our program, but another program to do a full credit check for some, someone simply trying to get assistance from treasury. Now we, so I understand the point. We actually intervened on that situation, uh, but your point is well taken about how we can take a fresh look at our rules to facilitate more cultural sensitivity and uh, the point about length of service time is a very real one in all of our agencies. Thank you for sharing it. Thank Please. I am... Aloha, I'm Paige from the Council for Native Hawaiian Investment. We brought a few handouts um, to give you some statistics and as well as some information on our organization. Uh, Leona will speak on the handout, which we have one of the programs that we work in partnership with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Um, so the Council of Native Hawaiian Advancement has been around for over 20 years, nonprofit member-based organization. We do our best to uplift uh, Native Hawaiians in the community, both culturally, economically, and social development. Uh, we do a number of different programs. Of course, housing is one of them. Um, but we just recently had our Nash, uh, first convention on the continent in Las Vegas last week. We hold one every year, but this was the first time we did one um, on the continent because I don't know if you've watched American Idol and E.M. Tongi, and he talked about being priced out of paradise, paradise how he moved uh, from the islands and to Seattle. Um, and it's, it's quite sad that a lot of the Native Hawaiians have moved, um, and although they've been displaced on our island, you know, we, they just can't afford it. So, you know, how can we do better? How can we do more? You know, like to reiterate Chelsea's comments, it's, it's just a lot of um, processes and it takes a lot of time. Uh, Native Hawaiians do need a lot of that trust. We went to a rural area for the last, twice in the last three months and only a handful of Native Hawaiians came out. They don't have a lot of their paperwork, or there's just a lot of things that, like Chelsea said, we need to check the boxes off. It just takes time. If you look at the last um, page on that handout we gave, it gives you some of the, the data on just a few of the, um, on this program, on, on the applicants that we were working with. A lot of them are ineligible. 
um, because they either don't qualify with their income, they get pension, social security that disqualifies them, um, or they just withdraw because it takes a little bit too much time. So it really takes uh, a lot of partnership and building that relationship and a lot of it is just time. I mean, Leona can speak a little bit more about actual you know, experiences she had working with these specific groups of people, which we call kupuna, our elderly, which has a growing need um, in our state that are very close to being houseless. They are on a fixed budget, fixed income, and yet they can't qualify for a lot of the, the programs. So I'll hand it off to Leona to speak a little bit about that. Aloha, thank you for having us here. Um, I originally came from the rental utilities program, and then I moved to the homeowners assistance fund program, and now uh, the housing counseling program that we have with uh, Department of Homeland's Kupuna resident rental subsidy program. And I heard all the stories from rent, utilities, relief program, the OHAF, and the DHHL Kupuna. So my main focus today is the DHHL Kupuna Rental Subsidy Program. And on June 1st, I went to Molokai, it's a neighbor island, to have a one-on-one -on -one housing counseling with a, a gentleman who is 67 years old. He's only on Social Security, uh, and he can't afford his rent, can't afford basic living. His, uh, his only expense is to feed his dog and to come to the main island of Oahu or Maui for doctor's appointments. He has to fly there. I took a nine-seater passenger plane to get there to see him. Breaks my heart. Um, he can't afford to live where he's living, can't move, um, should he get evicted because his rent goes up at least 10% every year. His income doesn't raise that much, but his rent does. And um, they run credit check, he can't move. But um, wondering what we can do for him. So this rental uh, assistance program for our Kapunas is that we pay 30% of his rent. But it only lasts so long. And mind you, these are all potential homeowners on the HHL wait list. On that wait list, there is over 45,000 people waiting. And on that wait list, most, a lot of, not most, a lot of them pass, never get to see an award from the state or Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Um, Very difficult for all of them. They're, they're waiting for either agricultural, resident, or pastoral lands. Some of the stories I hear, they can't afford to even buy their medicines, even though they're on a fixed income. But they take their meds maybe every other day or every other two days so they, don't, they can stretch their monies to afford their medicines. So the stories I hear is that I don't know if I, I'm going to be able to live that long to become a homeowner or to be able to stay in where I'm staying because I can't afford my rent. They are well aware of it. So these are the issues our state faces every day. And I'm here to help them, but what can I do waiting for either a shelter, they, they don't want to move out of their homes, they don't want to move with family members, they don't want to move out of their home state. Their home state is the island of Molokai or the island of Honolulu. And so here we are. Um, they need a lending year, they need help. Food is another issue because the, our prices are, everything is shipped into Hawaii, so we have our food is um, higher than anywhere else. Um, so they grow, they plant. We have programs with CNHA that help them, teach them how to plant, teach them how to be self-sufficient. 
not just for our kupunas, but for any um, community who lives in our community to, to help themselves. Trade programs, we try the best we can. Um, I w went out to um, a rural area on the windward side in March. There are five people showed up. We had to go back out there again because they do not have access to internet. Uh, they don't know how to use it, they're elderly. And um, so we went out there last weekend to uh, help them again to get their documents. And, and um, one of our team members went to drive them home to go find their documents so, to bring them with back so we could you know, scan it and, and get their application in. We have 198 as of June 26 that are applicants, all potential homeowners. Uh, we don't know when they're gonna be awarded uh, a land or a property or, or a home, and, um, but I'm here to help them and I'm just asking what can we do more for them because they need more help, we need more help. So with that, thank you so much for hearing us and allowing us to be here today. Thank you. Thank you for your candor. Thank you for your heart. And thank you for the empathy that you bring to your work every day. Um, the nation has an affordable housing crisis. We at HUD, you know, I'm not supposed to speak to budgets. I'm actually prohibited to that. But we wish we had a lot more resources to deliver more services across the country. And hopefully through the public watching, informative events such as this, as well as all of our collective efforts, more resources will become available. Uh, I would like to invite the members of the committee to join the conversation. Uh, I'm told that our online members uh, actually have, um, they can hear again. Uh, so I'd like to begin, if I could, maybe with Marsha, if you're out there, to join the conversation. Do you have anything you'd like to share? Uh, Clearly, what we are hearing from our tour yesterday and today is there's a need also for greater focus to sustain tenancies as well in decent and affordable housing. And that is very much an at-risk population in, in the community. Uh, and I actually, Chelsea, if I would, I would love to have an offline conversation to share with you all the reasons that you should remain a HUD-approved housing counseling organization. We are literally the best as far as service delivery. Yes, we have expectations for that, but I believe you're gonna see more and more of the private sector is gonna to look to see that seal of approval and how they engage on all of our issues. Marsha, good, can you hear us now? Please feel free to jump in. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for um, allowing me to, to be a part of this conversation. I. Um, you know, I spent many years, I retired from HUD, um, from the Office of Public and Indian Housing. I now am a CEO of a housing authority. And in the work that I do, and in the past work that I've done, where I spent a lot of time um, working with um, law enforcement on, on cultural diversity, I just learned in these last few moments how much I don't know. And I feel so selfish and, and self-centered about my, my beliefs. I, I'll be 65 this year. And I, I feel like I have, even though I knew better, I still had narrowed my focus, even with all this work that I do. And so it makes it even more meaningful to be a part of an organization that can extend across this country to help people become homeowners and to be able to live in housing that um, they so greatly deserve. Um, the one thing that I, that I thought of as different people were talking, I heard about the internet and the, the lack of the ability for people to be able to have access to the internet. Um, in other divisions of HUD, there are programs and funding on extending internet availability. Maybe that's something that a conversation of some type that may be held, a, a recent public and 
Indian housing notice was just issued here in the last 30 days. I, I, it may have been a couple of weeks now on um, implementing internet access in affordable housing. And maybe that could be extended or that conversation can be held about how that might be attached to for the purposes of, of homeowners and homeownership to extend the ability for people to be able to navigate our systems because we all have to navigate them now using the web. Um, here I am now because of a family crisis using the web. So um, I don't know, that that came to my mind and I, and I will send the notice, I will forward it uh, to you, uh, uh, David and Virginia, and uh, perhaps it, it may be something to, to start a, a conversation of how that may be carried over mm -hmm. uh, into this area to help people who don't have access. Sure, and, and we can work with the Region 9 staff to explore those opportunities further after this meeting. Um, another thing that we've been hearing from all of our providers, particularly the housing counselors we met yesterday with, Leona, was elderliness and the challenges that an older population is facing in the community right now. Uh, I'm referencing that because I'd like to invite Carol Dejanovich to join us. Carol is from the mortgage industry, but has a particular focus on elder issues. Carol, would you like to jump in? Uh, you may be muted. You may be muted, let's see. Yeah, we're being told you're muted. Still can't hear us, is that what you're saying? Hmm. Yeah, our tech team is saying that you're muted. I was just going to say, I'm going to piggyback exactly what Ms. Lewis said. I, my heart is pounding just hearing um, you know, it, it's a challenge that I go through every day trying to help our senior borrowers age in place and remain in the home that they love. And I too hear the stories of, you know, do we eat today or do we, you know, pay the bills? I'm embarrassed as well because I've been in the, this industry for a very, very long time. And I truly appreciate the insight I received today from, you know, my wonderful colleagues here. And, you know, one of the biggest things I, while I was listening, I worked on my, I work for a major federally chartered bank. We are not licensed in the state of Hawaii. And the reason being is the rules and regulations that have been set forth for us to become licensed in Hawaii are very cumbersome and extremely time consuming. So my licensing division has put that on um, the way bottom of my list of, of potential additional states for us to be licensed in. I want to change that now. I want to move it up because, you know, doing reverse mortgages, you know, I. I get that sense that I'm, I have an accomplishment, that I've helped someone. And I have been in that place also where, how do you help someone? And I, I just have, again, my heart is full. And I just want to say thank you so much. I've learned so much with this insight. And, you know, again, it's kind of given me that push now that I, there's something more I need to do. Thank you, Carol. And you know, whether it's HUD Section 202 programs or tax credit programs or lenders doing CRA-related financing with not-for-profit developers, it still remains a challenge just in every community across the country. Uh, and I wish I could respond to your points about doing more, but that's why we're here together, so we can find that strength and processes and approaches to try to do that. I want to turn to our in-person members, and uh, if it's uh, Sherry, uh, as a new member, can I, is there anything you'd like to share or respond to? Well, I definitely was struck um, by the 
the amount of emphasis on the elderly population and the number of people um, on the in the elderly pop population. I come from the East Coast, and um, it's such a broad issue that we don't really focus just on the elderly population. And I feel like there's a, a necessary balance that needs to take place in terms of supporting the rental assistance needs of that population as well as trying to get more young people into housing so that they don't have this issue when they become elderly because they'll have had the wealth building benefits of home ownership. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested in seeing what else we can do and um, how we can work together to, to provide those resources. I want to acknowledge the point that was made about the holistic role of housing counselors nationwide. Whether we're dealing with elders, often we're hearing about, unfortunately, elder abuse. Or if we're dealing with a low-income family or household, as you noted, they may be making tough budget choices about medical care versus paying the rent uh, or nutritional needs. And I have to say, we have to take a moment to acknowledge the work of housing counselors nationwide, because the safety net of housing counselors is much larger than the five requirements of what housing counseling is. And when you're dealing with a family who's experienced a natural disaster, for example, we don't want to be having to say, we have to do a budget before we work with you. And in fact, I want to share with our entire audience that we have actually covered that ground. When we're responding to a disaster as housing counseling is moving forward, our priority is providing assistance for immediate relief and rehousing. And we'll provide the other aspects of counseling later, but we've actually gone to our Office of General Counsel to clarify that. So the role of housing counselors is very, very important for the well-being for the sustainability of a family, of a household unit, and as well as for elders. And I think that's a very important takeaway in how we present housing counseling as well. Uh, as we look to modernize our standards of how we deliver services and simplify as well some of those standards, we also have to acknowledge that counselors do a lot more than the traditional definition. And I'll highlight that during the pandemic. Our agencies have provided over 300,000 sessions over the past two years simply to help people apply for Treasury financial support. And a lot of that has been providing interpretation so people understand and how, know how to apply for that support. And that's something we also heard, uh, Angie, I think we heard on our tour yesterday as well. Uh, so I just want to share that because I appreciate the candor here. Th these are challenging issues and times where we're working with consumers. Angie, let me invite you to respond to anything that you've heard. Sure, thank you. Um, I, I, I had the uh, privilege of, um, um, as part of the National Capacity Board um, earlier this year, we did uh, make a visit um, to Hawaii and um, visited um, several of the organizations um, <coughs> on Oahu and really got uh, an in-depth uh, view of the challenges um, that, uh, unique challenges um, that uh, Native Hawaiians face. And so I'm just really glad that they could be here today to raise um, some of these issues that um, you know usually we don't get to hear about. Um, I think some of the challenges that um, you know I've also heard from Chelsea is that um, uh, you know, on um, in the state of Hawaii, um, there are uh, definitely fewer banks. Um, you know, heard earlier from Carol. Um, you know, I think many of the large banks uh, institutions are not uh, do not have a presence in Bank of Hawaii, so that um, people home homeowners uh, do not have as many options to choose from. And from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, because of the unique situation with Native Hawaiians, when you access home ownership, it's a 99-year lease, and so not all lenders are willing to work with a ground lease. That they they only want to work with fee simple, and so whereas you know on the mainland, 
you know, we have access to a lot of different lenders. So some don't want to deal with ground leases, but we can find others who are willing to work with the more um, complicated uh, land ownership and financing structures. So I think that's also mm-hmm. a barrier. So it sounds like the challenges are from m- multiple facets. Yeah. Angie, thank you so much. And one of my takeaways here, we've been very focused on home ownership and recognizing the importance of culturally sensitive or services where of course language access is very much supported. But one of my takeaways so far is we also need to be applying that same stream of thought to working in a tenancy environment to allow for more support and resources to go to that longer duration session. Uh, And I invite everyone to think about that a little bit more. Perhaps we can engage with our counseling agencies nationwide on that front as well. Um, I'm, I'm seeing this as an emerging issue of great importance in the community that we're de- engaging with today. Daniel, please feel free to jump in. You know, the past day or so, and of course listening to you lovely ladies talk about the issues you're facing, you know, it, it, I represent the, the mortgage to housing finance uh, industry uh, on this committee, and throughout my whole career we've always focused on when we talked about affordable housing, the home ownership side, but it's a real big eye opener to see that how complex affordable housing is, but also how important housing counseling is to that complexity. Um, You know, I, I just, I'm just so appreciative of, you know, the information that you brought because it, it helps me to see that there's another whole, a whole different aspect of affordable housing that really needs to be addressed, that there's a bigger picture than just home ownership. Um, you know, affordable housing is more than just about being able to own a home, but having a safe, decent, affordable place to live. Um, and, you know, this yesterday was pretty eye-opening for me to see that a lot of the organizations, the work that they're doing here is in affordable rental housing. Um, and, you know, looking at the city and, you know, how expensive rentals can be and how, you know, income isn't quite reached that level of inflation with rentals and things like that. And that's a nationwide problem because we see a lot of that in where I'm from. I'm Dallas, Texas. So we see that. And but it's good. It's a great eye opener to be able to um, see the complexity of it. It's not just about home ownership, but it's having an affordable, decent place to live and not being pushed out of, you know, we see a lot of, you know, the developments and things like that. We talked a little bit about gentrification and things like that yesterday, and it's, it's really a problem. Um, but thank you for bringing that up because, you know, it helps us to maintain our focus and refocus if we have to. So thank you for that. Thank you, Daniel. Ibi Joke, let's turn to you. Uh, anything you'd like to share or respond to? Sure, absolutely. Um, I I just kind of want to piggyback off of everyone else's remarks. I think uh, our tour yesterday and the remarks um, from this morning uh, are really a reminder that communities of color are not monolithic. Um, And while we may have comparable issues, there definitely has to be um, a difference and a consideration of approach to how we address the issues in the respective communities that we serve. Um, And so even just listening to um, some of your comments earlier this morning, um, you know, this is a lesson that I learned um, during my fair housing days and us trying to work on the housing discrimination study of 2012 and finding Asian testers. And they literally sat us down because we we didn't have enough testers because we hadn't built trust within that community. Um, And so I thank you for the reminder of the importance of us listening and strategizing around creative approaches and strategies to truly addressing um, the needs of the communities that we're serving. Thank you very much. Lawrence, please, I invite you to join the conversation. Well, I was really touched in the effect that uh, when we went to the Housing Counseling Agency uh, yesterday, when the instructor or the founder, one of the founders, and she stated about why she was there and her passion for it. Uh, It was her passion. 
but at the same point in time, she looked at people and as they were coming, that there has to be a harmony. And, and that was her key word. Everything we can have, we can have the money, we can have a lot of things for individuals to live, but you have to have harmony together. And what was brought out, out, out of that, as I've heard here today, is that it's not just about home ownership, but it's really about individuals having the structure, the environment, a home to live in, to shelter for their families. And we are getting to that point right now where it is completely out of range for a lot of individuals. And I started asking myself the question, what do we now do with individuals who are, have incomes um, that can't match the communities they live in, but they have good credit, they have good, they can get down payment, but they can no longer afford it. Um, there are probably a number of things we can do, and my thought was, and you know, it was also looking at a rent to own program that allowed individuals to start the process of home ownership by renting, and, and you're looking at different other things in regards to the family as well. But they are, these are things that you just gotta look at. But to my, personally, the culture that, we, that they're in, everyone's culture, we just were in so many different cultural changes yesterday, from the Chinese to the Japanese to, to the uh, Asians. I mean, each one was unique and different. One thing that I did see is that uh, they stuck together. They had a passion for sticking together. So with that, I can only say that uh, we have a, a, a fight, a battle, and a, and a continuation that has to happen with the counseling agency to continue to do what they're doing so that we can educate and we can do those things to help them move forward. And it may be slow, but at the same point in time, you are accomplishing something you're not accomplishing something every day, but you are making a difference for the future that will come. Thank you, Lawrence. Yeah. And, <laughs> excuse me. I'm, I'm also fighting a cold from flying too much last week. I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, the other aspect, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about next steps, because I would like to have some of our team in the Office of Housing Counseling engage, perhaps, in a conversation with you after this meeting about what technical assistance, what are things that we can do within our current constraints to bring more assistance to you. Uh, and Terry, I'll ask that we follow up on that after, after the meeting and Jerry as well. I think uh, this has been very informative. Paul, let, let me turn to you. Thank you, David. Um, one of the things that um, I think I, I've got three questions for us to consider. Um, and the questions are based upon my experience, um, <clears throat> um, but also based upon our wonderful experiences yesterday and the presentations this morning. Um, so let me, let me read them. So it's, um, ha have there been discussions within HUD, <coughs> excuse me, to change the income levels upward for Section 8 housing vouchers to make more people, families eligible. With rents increasing and salaries not increasing, folks are being priced out and need assistance. That's number one. Number two, <coughs> and this is very important in, in I, I, I'm, live in Massachusetts, but not in Boston. And my question is how can geographic areas that are used for determining, quote, affordable rents be changed? Medway, the town where I live, is lumped in with Boston. And as a result, the affordable rent is not really affordable. Um, and the third 
item is, and, and this was reinforced so much yesterday, how can HUD increase awareness of programs that are available for seniors who are tenants to stay in their current apartments, different from the reverse mortgage programs for owners? Um, I think we have challenges. I don't know what the solutions are, but I think if we can identify the challenges and work together um, with, with all the folks who um, have kind of dedicated their lives to housing counseling and helping people who are less fortunate among us, I think we can come up with solutions. Well, I'll simply speak for my colleagues at HUD that, of course, uh, the approved levels for Section 8 assistance, the importance of expanding the impact of all of our programs is a constant on our staff's mind and our leadership's mind. Uh, ultimately, the availability of funds is more impacted through the appropriations process and decisions that are made by our congressional leaders. Uh, and of course, HUD has to work within the constraints of each budget. That said, I think your points are very well taken, though. Uh, I think there is a need to reach and educate more consumers uh, I'm actually very pleased, back, stepping back to Terry's presentation about our awareness campaign, each year we're going to be changing up the theme of the campaign. The goal is to elevate the profession, of course, for HUD certified housing counselors, but more importantly, I have established a very aspirational goal for our program. We currently reach 1.2 million consumers or so each year, depending on the year. But we have a very ambitious goal within the next five years to reach 3 million consumers a year. And we believe that our outreach campaign, we also believe that a host of programs that are being developed by the public and the private sector are going to leverage more growth for housing counseling in fee-for-service, as well as in a number of different areas. And I think the point is very well taken about working more closely with our partners, whether it be, for example, organizations that serve elder populations, like the AARP Foundation, to get the word out, or others, is, is a good next step recommendation. Um, so thank you, thank you, Paul, for sharing that. Tony. Sure, thanks, David. Uh, really just hope there's a lot more follow-up <laughs> to this type of meeting. Uh, you know, thanks to the panelists for coming out here. I think, you know, as we take this committee, uh, hopefully to these different parts of the country and different communities, we, we're learning a lot. But I don't, I don't know that this, you know, last 45 minute panel is really helping inform us on, you know, the, a lot of the nuances that are facing Native Hawaiian communities in particular. I'm sure it's going to be kind of the same that we hear from all the other kind of communities that we visit and learn about. So hopefully it just kind of spurs more conversations and uh, from the OHC staff and, and, and among the committee members as well. And then we get to learn more about it in depth because just my understanding and, and, and my experiences with uh, tribal communities across the country and Native Hawaiian communities, uh, this, the nuances are almost enough to be overwhelming to where you just kind of stop <laughs> stop yourself from learning more because you can just go so far into the weeds that um, you just learn how, how intensive the work really is to be able to make some impacts and changes in these communities. So hopefully it's just the start of this conversation and, and there's some more follow-up uh, among all of us here today that as we're learning about it. Because I'm sure, just think of like 99 year homestead leases are just terms that people on the committee here have probably never even heard of or encountered. So just, uh, it's hard to make, you know, good recommendations and, 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 you know, have good quality discussions when there's just really not even a grounding on what some of the underlying issues that these communities face, uh, and particularly Native Hawaiians are such a, uh, 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 you know, uh, back of the mind for, for so many of our policymakers and, and, and in the mortgage industry is just not something they think about day to day. So we're just trying to wait, raise that awareness. So it's great that we've had the conversation started here, but hopefully there's a lot more uh, that we continue to have. Thank you, Tony. And I just want to double check. Uh, do we have any other members of the committee uh, who just joined online? No? Oh, okay. Uh, Richard, would you like to join the conversation? All right, we, 
We don't hear you yet. Let's get you ready. So I just want to thank everyone and continue the conversation. Great. All right, Bill, thank you. I'm sorry, Richard, thank you. And Bill? Okay, I think he's looking to unmute. You can't hear us? No, okay. We'll try to work through those IT issues and we'll, after we adjourn. Okay, very good. Um, I want to thank each of our panelists. And Joyce, thank you so much for really, I, I think this really has educated us and increased our awareness. I know it has increased my awareness. And uh, we do want to follow up with you to continue this conversation and try to develop a plan to do more. Of course, across everywhere that we serve, but in particular, hearing some of the challenges of Hawaii, uh, I think this has been very helpful, and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, we are too. going to break for 45 minutes now uh, for lunch. Joyce, was there something that you wanted to add? Oh, I, I guess I just wanted to say that, you know, since our members came so far from Hawaii, if there's an opportunity for them to maybe share a closing thought, if that's a possibility. I know we're about to go to lunch, but... They did come so far. I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, I was trying to be sensitive to time, but please, is there anything that you'd like to share? I think for me, I think if there's um, an opportunity to sit and think about something, I think from what I've heard from some of you committee members of what kind of the nuances of Native Hawaiians are in Hawaii, I think the top thing on my head would be, as a HUD certified organization, like I mentioned before, we have to serve everyone. Right now, we have about 310,000 Hawaiians in Hawaii and 360 to 70,000 Hawaiians outside of Hawaii. It's the first time ever in history where we have more Hawaiians outside of Hawaii because of the cost of living. As a HUD certified organization, because we have to serve everyone, we are starting to view whether or not we are part of the problem because we get new housing developments, we get people that move from the states who have had opportunities to live in lower cost areas, save more money, come in and be able to qualify for mortgages much quicker, who we serve through housing, through housing um, home ownership counseling. And they're able to capture homes more than Native Hawaiians do. So being a HUD organization is really trying to and I definitely want to have more conversations of why we should stay one, but I think that's one thing that's not being thought of, is as long as we need to serve everyone, we may be part of the problem, and HUD may be part of the problem of why Native Hawaiians cannot stay in Hawaii, and I think we need to kind of dig deeper into that, how we can support Native Hawaiians to stay. So, uh, I look forward to our conversation. Um, HUD does not require you to serve everyone. It requires you to you have a work plan and to realize what's included in our funding in the work plan. But I'd love to have the conversation with you because for example, if there are more, many middle income consumers coming to you for home ownership counseling to apply for a mortgage, that's a perfect opportunity for fee for service to extend your resources. There, so I'd love to have a creative brainstorming conversation with you about that. Um, very interesting issue, though, about people living on the mainland versus on the islands as well. Again, we have a lot to learn here today. Please. Thank you. I, um, I am a recipient of that 99-year lease. I'm proud of it. I'm very grateful and fortunate that I can own a home. Um, also, uh, just to let you know, the average rent in Hawaii is 2800 whether you are a elderly or not. And um, for 21, I have an uh, elderly, 2,100 a month, 1,900 a month, 1,500 a month. They don't, their income is not nearly close to that. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I, I live on Oahu, um, been there for years. And now when I go to the beaches, it's tent city because all you see is people living on the beaches in tents. You also see people who can't afford their rent, so they go and get a boat. They live on their boat because they can't afford their rent. So what do they do? The, the state created a law, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. you can bring your boat in. After 5 p.m. you have to take your boat 100 yards out. Now from 5 p.m. to 6 a.m. the next day, you're out on the 
on, on your boat. These are uh, husband and wife living on their boat. They can't afford rent. So these are the challenges, little of the challenges I, and stories that I see every day. So pleading, asking, what can we do more for them? As far as access, I, I live in, in an area that uh, for 14 years, just recently, was I able to get, um, there was only one company that allowed us to have internet in our area. There's another company, but there's only one that can do business in our area. So as far as having internet access, sometimes it's not feasible I, for that internet access. I invite the entire community to keep an eye on HUD's affirmatively furthering regulation, because many of these issues actually you will be able to comment on as far as what entitlement communities are doing about some of these challenges. And affirmatively furthering, as our colleagues from FHEO would tell you, deal much more than simply the provision of housing or housing discrimination. They really address the quality of life and what services are offered in each neighborhood. And obviously the rule has to be finalized, but keep an eye on that rule, I would suggest. Please, for the final word. <laughs> to thank everyone again. I'm glad we were able to enlighten and hopefully give a little bit more insight into Native Hawaiian um, that we service in Hawaii. Um, I would welcome the committee to have a meeting there. I'm sure we'd love to host and show you where, you know, a lot of the houseless is. Like Leona mentioned, it's tent city on the beaches. You know, it used to be pristine beaches and now you just see tents and you know, close to half of the, the houseless population is Native Hawaiians. So it's very eye-opening. Um, it's very sad for us to think, you know, what is affordable housing? Um, like you mentioned, I mean, we're, we're on islands, so we're very limited. You know, land is, is definitely um, very rare to come by. So uh, the average median home is a million dollars. Uh, so what is affordable? When you're dealing with the kupuna, the elderly who are on a fixed income, they're eligible for a homeowner, but they've been on the list, but can they really afford to now purchase a home? Um, and you know, a lot of them have died on the wait list waiting to get that land. Um, so how do we you know, provide a little bit more, like you know, we mentioned about rental assistance and getting, having them comfortable in where they are and just surviving in, in their native land? Again, thank you for your candor, and clearly the issue of homelessness or the lack of affordable housing is a nationwide situation. Of course, HUD has been taking a lot of very proactive steps to address homelessness, but in each area, the issue is quite different and unique. So this is an area as well. I hope we can work with our regional staff to bring, bring more resources to bear. Um, I want to share with our viewing audience, uh, you may have noted that a number of documents, PowerPoints were shared by hand, hard copy around uh, the members with the members today. Uh, as we, when we post this uh, recording or videotape online, we will work to drop those PowerPoints into the presentation. So I'd ask our presenters to share electronic copies with us. Uh, we are going to adjourn now for 35 minutes for lunch and then immediately reconvene at uh, 1.30 Pacific Standard Time. Thank you, everyone.